Okay, welcome. So good morning. Um, this uh, is the tutorials on Ismara and Crema. So I'm Erik van Inwegen and um, Mikhail Pochkov is the other lecturer that will be speaking today. And then uh, during the afternoon's exercise sessions, we will also be helped by Daan de Groot and uh, Anura Ranjak. All right, so quickly the agenda for today. Um, so this first session, I will give an introduction about uh, ISMARA and the general um, motif activity response analysis modeling. And so this concerns the modeling of gene expression data in terms of predicted regulatory sites. Um, then at uh, 1030, there will be half hour coffee break. After the coffee break, there will be another session where I will lecture uh, on the theory and the um, results that are given by our second tool called CREMA for cis regulatory element motif activities. And this is about the modeling of the chromatin state at distal regulatory sites in terms of predicted binding sites of transcription factors. There will be lunch. After lunch, Mikhail will give a lecture about the actual details of how you use the web interface, what kind of species are supported, what kind of data types, how you upload data or otherwise submit data to the servers, um, how you interactively use the results, how you can download the results and so on. <clears throat> then there's a coffee break. And then finally, there's a hands-on exercises. So we hope that many of you have submitted some of your own data and have received some results on this on this data. And so in this last session, you will be able um, to together with uh, with R4 um, interactively go over what are, do some of your results mean and so on. All right. So uh, our group is offering a number of web services, uh, all having to do with uh, computational biology, many having to do with computational regulatory genomics, so learning about regulatory networks. And uh, so we have a general portal called swissregulon.unibus.ch that looks like this. This is a picture of the website um, through which all these services are available. And so today I'm going to be talking about ISMARA and, uh, and CREMA. But if you want, you can also go there and see there is also other software you can download and so on for various applications. All right. So um, ISMARA, of course, it has its own website. It has ismara.unibus.ch. And if you go there, you will get a, a relatively simple interface looking like this, which you can use to, to upload your data. All right. So to just introduce the, the whole topic of what are we trying to do here and what is the purpose of these, these tools, I want, I want to introduce you to some of the sort of questions that motivate the research in my lab. And so uh, one of the questions that really motivates me is that um, it's good to remind yourself that all these various different phenotypes of human cells, so these are all different human cell types, uh, that are incredibly varied, perform different functions, have different shapes. Um, they're all encoded by the same blueprint. So there's the same genome that's expressed in these very, very different phenotypes. And of course, we know how this works. It's not a big mystery. We know that inside cells, there are regulatory networks that control the expression of genes and thereby the phenotypes of different cells. But we don't really understand yet how these um, regulatory networks function as systems on a, on a genome-wide scale. And these are the questions that we're uh, interested in in my group. So typical questions that we might try to answer is, what is a cell type? Are there really discrete cell types? Or is it, are, are these not very discrete things? How do we classify different possible states that can be in? How is the identity of a cell stabilized? There's a lot of noise in these processes of gene expression. So how do cells know what type they have to be? What are the key pieces of information that stabilize cell identity and determine it? And what are lots of details that don't matter? All right, so I started working on this topic now almost 25 uh, years ago. 
And uh, at the time, I was very uh, convinced that with the establishment of genome sequencing and the abilities to measure the expression of all genes, this would be a problem that we were going to solve on a fairly short time scale. But uh, it turned out to, to be a little bit more difficult. And uh, so I don't know if some of you uh, have heard about um, this effect that is described in psychological literature and is known as the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, where there was a study done um, that tracked how the confidence that people have about their abilities to solve problems in a particular domain depends on how much they've studied the topic. And basically what you find is that if people study knowing nothing about some topic because they haven't even looked at it or studied it, then they also have very low confidence that they can solve problems on this topic. And then as they start studying uh, the topic, they start getting more confident that they know a lot about the topic and that they get confident that they will be able to solve problems. And so their confidence goes up, but then they reach a, a sort of a peak at some point and this peak kind of happens when they're starting to get a sense of how large the topic is and how many things there are that they know nothing about, even though they have already studied the topic for quite a bit. And then their, their confidence will start sharply dropping. And um, so I would say that um, I myself are somewhere here, almost in, in free fall uh, down this slope where um, as I've studied this topic more, I've become more and more confident that actually understanding how these genome-wide regulatory networks work is a far harder problem than, uh, than I sort of anticipated. And actually, then I think many people think. So some of my worries are that we think we, we can measure a lot. You know, we can measure gene expression, we can measure chromatin state and so on. But there are still many, many more things going on in the cell that we do not know how to measure and that we do not know how to look at. And all those things are also important for the functioning of these regulatory networks. And so we only really know a sliver of the things that are going on. We have no ability to model all the things that are going on in a meaningful way. And the high throughput measurements that we make are often problematic in the sense that they have artifacts, they have biases that we often don't quite understand. This is also making it hard to interpret such data. And the way most people are analyzing data of this type involves very complicated arrays of normalizations and filters and transformations. So that at the end of the day, uh, it's actually hard to relate your results to the, the ground truth of what's going on in the cells. All right, so this is just basically giving you a context where I'm saying that I think the abilities for ourselves to understand what's happening with these regulatory circuits are really quite limited. So then the question is, okay, well, you say it's a hard problem. What useful things do you think you can still do? And I, so I think the best thing we can do with computational analysis today is to basically develop methods that are robust, that are transparent, that are as sort of simple as we can make it to simply extract from the data useful information to make useful hypotheses that can then help guide experimental efforts. So I don't think that we should think that we're gonna somehow understand how this whole system functions. The best thing we can do is to extract some hypotheses from this data to help us focus on where should we do our next experiments and what kind of next experiments would be most interesting. All right, so what are the kind of questions that we have in mind? So the questions we have in mind with our tools are people um, have done transcriptome or epigenome measurements on some system that they're interested in, and they're interested in knowing what kind of regulation is happening in my system. So here are some examples of systems that we've worked on, uh, differentiation of monoblasts into macrophages, mouse stem cells differentiating into pyramidal neurons, uh, epithelial mesenchyme transition as induced by TGF-beta treatment. So these are just some examples of um, things that we've worked on with experimental groups and where the people doing the measurements on these systems were interested in how 
how are these processes regulated? And the challenges for experimentalists are that it's hard to do saturating screening because there are so many possible regulators, so many transcription factors, microRNAs that could play a role. You cannot check all of them experimentally. That's hard to do. Now, it's relatively easy to do high throughput measurements like RNA-seq or chip-seq or attack-seq to measure things genome-wide. But experimental labs often do not have the expertise to take such high throughput data and infer what that says about regulation in their system. So they can, of course, then try to make uh, dedicated collaborations with computational labs that know how to do such things, but they have to do that on a per case basis, and it's a big investment of time and effort. So we're trying to develop methods that help with this kind of situation. Um, so to make a little bit of a, a contrast with what I would say are like traditional methods for, for analyzing such data, is that so how do people normally uh, look at genome-wide gene expression data? Um, so there is some basic processing to be done. So you map your reads to transcripts, you find genes that are expressed, you start looking for genes that are differentially expressed across the condition. So you can get a list of genes that are differentially expressed and maybe um, what is also traditionally a um, popular approach is to let's say make clusters of genes with similar expression. So to find groups of genes that are expressed in a similar way across your samples, and then maybe look at what categories of genes are enriched uh, in these different data sets. All right, so here's an example where you make some sort of clustering and you find uh, groups of genes go together, and then you look what kind of categories of function are um, enriched among these groups of genes. Now, the limitations of these kind of approaches is that it doesn't really tell you anything about the regulation that's going on in your system. So you, you'll find out that certain genes are co-expressed, but you don't know why they're co-expressed. You don't know what the regulators are responsible for driving these expression changes. And also it's often unclear what the kind of follow-up experiments are that you're going to do. What is sort of the next experiment that will teach you more how does it help me to know that there is a certain set of genes that are co-expressed? How do I now validate this observation? Might not be so clear. All right. So what is our um, ISMARA tool doing? So this website allows uh, people to upload um, microarray or RNA-seq gene expression data across a set of samples. And you simply upload it to the server and, and, and say go. And then basically what the tool will do is it will infer for you what are the key regulators, both transcription factors and microRNAs, that are responsible for the expression changes in your system that are driving the expression changes across your samples. What are the activities of these regulators across the samples? Okay, so which transcription factors are active in which cells and inactive or in which samples and inactive in what other samples? What are the target genes and pathways for each of these regulators? What are the actual binding sites on the genome through which these regulators act? And what are interactions between the, the regulators? And so this, um, the approach was, was first pioneered in this, in this paper in 2009, and then we turned it into a, a more automated tool in, uh, in 2014, and it has undergone quite some, some development since. And so I will tell you today about what's the theory behind and what are the results that uh, it's giving you. All right, so this slide is basically giving you uh, an overview of um, the ISMARA modeling approach, and it exists of various parts, and I will discuss each part in turn. So the first part that I will discuss is the, the identification of regulatory sites genome-wide and the summary of that into a matrix, which we call a site count matrix. All right. So the first thing that we need to do for any species for which we want to analyze gene expression data is to construct what we call a promoterome. It's a set of all promoters in the genome of that species, right? So places from which transcription can start. 
and a set of transcripts for transcriptome. So for most of the species that are available through ISMARA, uh, the way we've created these promoteromes is that we collect collected experimentally measured transcript uh, transcription start sites. So there are various methodologies available for detecting transcription start sites genome-wide. The one that we've used most is called CAGE-SEC that are capturing five prime ends of mRNA. And then we combine that with collections of full-length mRNAs that come from databases like GenBank, GeneCode, or Ensemble. And uh, the methods that we use for that are described here in this um, genome biology paper from 2009. So to just illustrate how it works, it's really quite simple. Um, we basically have these full-length transcripts. Here I'm showing you just a zoom in on a genome browser of start sites and known transcripts for one particular gene called HSTBP1. Uh, this gene is transcribed on the negative strand, so it goes from, from right to left. And you see that there are many different isoforms known of this gene and uh, that have start sites in different positions. So one transcript starts here, one here, one there, 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 there. Okay? And basically what we do is we take all these known transcript and start sites and transcription start sites that are within 150 base pairs of each other, which is basically the, the amount of DNA covered by a single nucleosome, those are clustered together and are called the same promoter. Okay, so why did we choose this, this cutoff on the clustering? First of all, um, this 150 base pair is a um, natural length scale on eukaryotic genomes because most of the DNA is covered by nucleosomes most of the time and is inaccessible. And whenever transcription happens, the DNA is made accessible and these accessible regions come in sort of chunks of 150 base pairs because every time a nucleosome comes off, it leaves 150 base pair open region. And second, we found experimentally that if you look at the correlation structure of promoters, different start sites, you find that start sites that are within 150 base pair from each other, so that, that are within the same nucleosome free region, they tend to show correlated gene expression patterns. So they're often co-regulated. And what we believe is actually that the RNA polymerase sort of moves around and sort of starts from different places in an almost random manner in these uh, nucleosome free regions. And so that's the reason why we cluster promoters that are within 150 base pairs, all right? So at the end of the day, we have a set of transcripts and for, uh, and we have a set of promoters and for each promoter on the genome, we have a list of what are all the transcripts that start from this promoter. All right. So the, se the second thing that we want to now do is to pre predict transcription factor binding sites in these promoters to predict what transcription factors might be regulating each of these promoters. Okay. And so, um, so this is, a, again, a topic on which I could, you know, probably lecture the, the whole day. So I have to give you a very summarized uh, description. So basically, each transcription factor um, in an organism recognizes specific patterns of sites of small DNA uh, sequences on the genome. And um, the way that the binding preferences of different transcription factors are typically represented is by something called a position-specific weight matrix. And there are pictures made of these weight matrices, which are called these sequence logos, of which you see a couple of examples here. So to just explain you what it is, um, here is a sequence logo for a transcription factor actually from the bacterium E. coli. Here is a list of known binding sites of this transcription factor that have been aligned with each other. And so basically what you could now do is you can go column by column, and in each column you can count how many of the binding sites have a C at this position, how many have a T, how many have a G, how many have an A. And basically you, you calculate these fractions. So here at position four, 6% of the sequences have an A, 53% have a C, 
uh, 27% a G and 30% a T. And so uh, this is one column of the weight matrix. So the, the matrix is the length of the binding site by four for each of the four letters. And it basically gives you the probability that the letter at position I of the binding site is letter alpha. And then the probability for a particular sequence of the binding site is simply the product of the weight matrix entries along the binding site. And these logos make pictures for this, right? So if a letter is big like a T here, it means that it's very likely that this position is a T, this position can be a G or a C and so on, right? And so um, over you know, a large amount of time using lots of experimental data, large collections of such weight matrices have been created for large numbers of transcription factors in, in many genomes of model organisms. And so we use these kind of weight matrices to predict binding sites on the genome for transcription factors. So how we do that is again, there is a lot of machinery behind that that I don't have time to talk about today. It's not the main uh, focus of this um, presentation, but basically we combine the sequence patterns that you find in the DNA with patterns of conservation of the sequence across related species. So let's say if I want to predict binding sites in, in the human genome, and I have some promoter uh, of a human gene, I take a chunk of sequence around the start site of this promoter, typically one kilobase, and then we find in other organisms like mouse, dog, cat, horse, rhesus macaque, and so on, we find the orthologous region, that is the region that by descent, evolutionary descent, uh, is, is the same region, came from a common ancestor. And we align all these sequence regions with each other, right? So then you can see which, which columns in this alignment have been conserved and where there are mutations. And then what we do is we, we scan with weight matrices over this alignment. And at each position, like for example here, we basically calculate, uh, we use a probabilistic model to calculate how likely is this entire alignment under the assumption that all these sequences have been evolving according to the constraints set by the fact that it needs to be a binding site for this transcription factor. So we also use the fact that we know the phylogeny between all these species. So we know what the length of the branches are. And so how much time there's been for mutations to happen. And so we can calculate how likely this, this block of the alignment is, assuming that it's under the constraint for remaining a binding site for this transcription factor, and how likely it is under some neutral evolution model where letters are free to mutate. And then we use this to assign a probability that this chunk of the alignment is a functional binding site for a given transcription factor. So we do this systematically in all promoters. We have alignments and for all transcription factors, where there's hundreds of transcription factors to make binding site predictions. All right, so uh, these binding site predictions actually we, we also offer through our Swiss Regulon server. So we have genome browsers where you can look genome wide what are the predicted binding sites for uh, uh, in each promoter? So here is one example promoter on the uh, human genome. This is actually the promoter of the snail three transcription factor, and in the neighborhood of this uh, promoter, these are the binding sites that are predicted. So the names that you see here are the names of the transcription factors that are predicted to bind there, and the intensity of the color give is proportional to the posterior probability that we've assigned to this binding site. That is to say how confident we are that this is a functional binding site. And so we take these genome-wide binding site predictions and we summarize them all into one big matrix, which we call the site count matrix, whose elements, so along all the rows are all the promoters. So there's about 35,000 or so promoters in the human genome. So there will be 35 rows, thousand rows in this matrix. And then the columns correspond to the different binding motifs, so the different transcription factors. So we have a, maybe 500 of those. And the entries, so for promoter P and motif M, the entry is the total number of binding sites 
that occur in, the, in promoter P for motif M. And it's the sum of the posterior probabilities of all the binary cells. All right. So if there are questions, please don't hesitate to, to stop me. So this is one important part. So we create this, this binding side matrix. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but um, we also predict binding sites for microRNAs. So we use tools that have been developed in other labs. I mean, we have collaborated with these labs, but it's not our main uh, work, where we look in the three prime ends of transcripts and we predict binding sites for microRNA that may be regulating the translation efficiency and stability of, of these transcripts. And so we also have for each microRNA mu and each promoter, we have a side count, which is the sum of the binding sites in the three prime UTRs of the transcripts associated with that promoter of binding sites for this microRNA. All right. So now uh, this is sort of one technical comment that I would like to make for people that maybe know a little bit more about this. So uh, as you might know, these collections of, of binding motifs for transcription factors have been made by many different groups and there are many different collections. So if you, if you go online, so we have our own collection in Swiss Regulon of binding motifs, um, but there are other resources like Jasper, Hokomoko, Homer, Uniprot, Encode, and so on, that also have published large collection of these position specific weight matrices. And so often there are many different regulatory motifs available for the same transcription factor, all right? So uh, we somehow had to curate this information. And so at some point, uh, these two group members, Daniel and, and Florian, what they did is they basically collected all motifs. So we started by about 2000 motifs from these various resources, predicted binding sites for all of them, and then used a very large collection of RNA-seq uh, gene expression data to basically select for each human and mouse transcription factor the regulatory motif that is associated with that transcription factor that gives best results on predicting the gene expression data. All right, so we basically for, for so the number of transcription factors in human and mouse is, is sort of close to 700 for which a motif is known. And then for each of these 700 transcription factors, we collected the best motif. Yes, Martin. You have a question, go ahead. Hello? Martin, do you want to ask your question? Oh, sorry about this. I was on mute, I think. Uh, very interesting presentation. I was just wondering how many species do you need uh, to to produce these types of clusters? Obviously, you're talking here about mice and human, but uh, I'm working actually on other organisms like uh, plants, for example. Yeah. So, so, um, so in the uh, presentation later today by Mikhail, he will go in detail over what are all the species that are currently uh, supported. But basically the, the, the power of the method is really proportional to how many um, regulatory motifs are available. So the more transcription factors have known binding specificities in your organism, the better you can do predictions. Now, yes. often, often you can, the, the way we do this, for example, so we recently made uh, Ismara available for zebrafish, which was previously not available. And for many of the zebrafish transcription factors, we used similarity of the DNA binding domains with DNA binding domains in other organisms like human, mouse, Drosophila that have been studied to predict the binding specificity of transcription factors in, in zebrafish and make genome-wide predictions. So these are the kind of approaches that you then have to use. But if you have an organism that is really not a model organism where very little is known about uh, what the transcription factors bind, then this will limit the ability to make predictions. Yeah, so in the alignment of autologous promoter sequences you presented earlier, um, so you have a number of organisms there 
Um, and what do you think? You need 10 different ones of uh, <laughs> spanning a phylogenetic space or something like that? Or... No, no. So again, this is a little bit of a, um, the, the answers to this question is always a little bit more complicated. So, okay. <laughs> so the thing is, okay, so you want, you want the other organisms that you use to be as informative as possible. So if you take, let's say, an organism that is virtually identical, right? So let's say if I, if I take human and chin, at the nucleotide level, they're 96%, 98% identical. And so most of the positions are anyway conserved. And so it's not very surprising that positions are conserved. So it gives you some information, but gives you little information. If you take human and mouse, then maybe in intergenic DNA, half of the nucleotides are conserved. That's still enough to make good alignments, but there's so many changes that if you see conserved blocks, now this is quite informative. So the most informative thing is to have species that are close enough such that you can unambiguously align intergenic regions and far enough that there's been enough mutations for you to detect uh, the effects of uh, purifying selection. And, and then, you know, uh, three, four species might be already enough, but if you have 10, well, well then it's better. Okay. Thank you. There was one more question. Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, now, if you have the multiple alignment for the coregulated, like the upstream region of some transcript. Yes. Uh, uh, do you in any way account uh, the sequence and structure dissimilarity of the reg regulator? Because the regulator might be also different and therefore yes, the binding question. region would be very, different. Very good question. Okay. So for this analysis, we assume that these species are close enough that the binding specificity of the regulator is, is virtually identical across the species. Okay. okay. So, 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 so if, if the DNA binding domain of the transcription factor in human and mouse is not quite the same, we're assuming it still binds the same motif. Now, okay, so that, that's an important assumption, but I think it's generally a very good assumption. Okay, it, it's really, it, so, okay, so for evolutionary reasons, so this is all very interesting, but I'm afraid I'm going to spend too much time on this. For evolutionary reasons, once a transcription factor is targeting hundreds of sites in the genome, it's very hard for it to move its sequence specificity, right? Because if you say, I now want to change my transcription factor to recognize an A rather than a C at this position in the site, you would have to change all the A's into C's at these hundreds of sites in the genome. This is very hard to do. So these binding specificities of transcription factor that targets lots of things, they get kind of frozen in. And it's sort of amazing how you can see, you can go all the way to C urgent and see that certain transcription factors in C urgent development are still bind, binding to the same kind of sites as the orthologous thing is doing in, in, in humans. So, so, okay, so, it, huh? so in your experience, it doesn't really matter. So the binding regions, even if the transcription factor is like different on uh, amino acid I'm, level. Okay, so I'm saying the following. If the intergenic regions, if the promo orthologous promoter regions are close enough that you can make good multiple alignments, and this is required to even use this information, then it's generally a good assumption that the transcription factors binding to the sites are still binding to the same motifs. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so we basically curated a set of, of the sort of best motifs for each transcription factor. And then in a final step that is very important, we actually look at what motifs are so similar that they essentially bind into highly overlapping groups of sites because there are many families of transcription factors in higher eukaryotes that bind to similar motifs. And so we make these motif groups that are groups of transcription factors that essentially bind to the same sites, okay? So that you get a kind of a non-redundant set of motifs. And so in human and mouse, an example, we have about 500 motifs 
representing close to, to 700 transcription factors. All right, where am I? Good. So this is the binding site promoterome transcriptome binding site predictions. The second part is now we're submitted data and we basically have to process uh, the raw gene expression data that we're given. So basically the way that this works is for RNA-seq, we essentially just map all the reads to the transcripts so that we can basically quantify the gene expression of each transcript in the genome. Uh, if we also still uh, allow people to upload microarray data, this is now quite old, but for people that still want to use this, so there you look at microarray probes associated with transcripts. And so the, the final result of this processing is going to be another matrix, which gives for each promoter P in each sample S, the expression of this promoter in that sample. So it gives you basically expression profiles across the samples. So this, that's conceptually what's happening. What is now actually happening? Is, what's the technical details? So again, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I want to say enough that sort of for experts, it's kind of clear what is happening. First of all, we use for the mapping uh, a tool from the lab of uh, Leo Pachter called Callisto. And Callisto maps the reads that are given to us, not to the genome, but directly to the transcriptome. Okay, so there's a set of transcripts and the reads are, are mapped to these transcripts. And if a read maps to multiple transcripts, its weight of one read is equally distributed over all the transcripts that it map, maps to. Okay, so basically I'm giving you here an example. So this is again near this HSP PP1 gene, and I'm having here one, two, three, four five reads that have been mapped there. And so this red read here maps to eight different transcripts. So all these transcripts get a weight of one eight. This read here, the blue one maps to two transcripts. So they each get a weight of, of um, a half and so on. This green one maps only to one. This one maps to six, I think, and so on. So now for each transcript, I'm going to sum these weights. So for example, for this transcript here, there is a weight of one eighth from the red and a, uh, an eighth and a weight of a half from the blue one. For this transcript here at the bottom, there is also one eighth from the red one. And then there is one from, from the green one and one sixth from the purple one. So for each transcript, we sum these weights over all reads that have been mapped to them. Then we divide that weight by the length of the transcript, right? So to normalize for the fact, I want to get a weight that is proportional to the number of mRNAs that there were for this transcript. So I have to divide by the length because you can have reads all along the transcript. And then finally, because Ismara looks at the expression at the level of promoters, I sum up all the weights from all the transcripts that are transcribed from the same promoter. So the weight for a promoter is now the sum of the weights of the transcripts associated with the promoter. Then to deal with zeros, there is a small pseudo count added. And then finally, um, the weights are normalized, multiplied by a million to turn this into transcripts per million transcript uh, um, unit of expression. And then we take the logarithm of the end. So the expression of each promoter in each sample is basically the logarithm of the number of transcripts we estimate per million transcripts that were driven by that promoter. Okay, so that's the quantification. And that is put in this big matrix. So the rows are again the promoters, the, the columns are the samples. And now we're finally going to model this expression in terms of the predicted binding sites. Okay, so um, actually let me, okay, so this slide is going through sort of the steps how this, this works. So there's quite some formulas on this slide, but it's actually really simple, okay? So the first step is for each sample S, we calculate what's the average expression of this sample, right? So you just sum over the promoters, divide by the promoters with the average expression. So the first thing we do is we subtract this average expression from each column, each sample. 
So this makes sure that the sum uh, along each column is now zero. Second, we take this side count matrix and calculate for each motif M, what is the average number of binding sites per promoter. So sum over the promoter divided by number is the average number of binding sites. And we now make this side count matrix in tilde by subtracting this average from each column again. Okay, so now again, for the side count matrix to, instead of having the absolute side count, you have the deviation of the side count from the average side count for this. And then what we do is we now model this new uh, gene expression in terms of activities of motifs. So we're going to assume that the expression level of promoter P in sample S is given by the sum of some unknown activity that motif M has in sample S times the number of binding sites in the promoter P for motif M, summed over all motifs. And we separate this into two parts. First, we want to fit the average expression in terms of the average activity of each motif. Okay, so the average expression of this promoter is just the average across all the samples. The average motif activity of motif M is again just the average of all the samples. So we separately fit this model for these averages. And then we make a final normalization where for each promoter we now subtract its average expression. So this new matrix E tilde has the log fall changes in expression of this promoter in each sample relative to its mean expression. So it, it captures the expression changes of the promoter. And similarly, we define these motif activity changes, which is this activity of motif M in sample S minus its average activity. And so we finally then model as a linear model, this E tilde in terms of the A tilde. All right, and so the way this actually technically works, again, it's not very complicated. It's a simple linear model. Uh, we assume uh, a Gaussian prior on uh, these motif activities uh, with an unknown, uh, um, which this is often called a uh, rich regression parameter, or it's just a parameter of this prior. We're going to optimize this also. And then basically, um, this, this model can be solved analytically using singular value decomposition. So there is this matrix W, which is essentially the covariance matrix of the side count across uh, pairs of motifs. There is this extra term coming from the prior. And then basically, the optimal motif activities are essentially just given by the, the inverse uh, of, of this matrix. And um, uh, the parameter lambda in this uh, fitting is optimized by essentially just maximizing the likelihood of the entire data when you uh, marginalize over all these unknown motif activities. Okay, so this is a standard Bayesian procedure for fitting this, um, this linear model um, using a uh, a Gaussian prior on the unknown motif activities. So that's the technical explanation for, for more technical people. For less technical people, the more conceptual um, explanation is that, so we've measured the expression level of each promoter in each sample, right? So this is log expression actually. And we have predicted for each promoter how many binding sites there are for each motif. So this is measured, this is predicted theoretically. And then finally, the, there are these unknown numbers, which is saying how active is each motif M in each sample S. So AMS is the activity of motif M in sample S. And then we're trying to find these motif activities. We try to fit the motif activities that can best explain the ob observed expression across the samples. So we infer both the best uh, fitted motif activity, a star MS. We also give error bars on these motif activities. So we say how certain we are of them. And then we can summarize the significance of each motif <clears throat> by basically looking at dividing this activity by its standard, by its error bar. So this is saying how many, how many standard deviations is this activity away from zero? 
squaring that, averaging these overall samples, and then taking the square root. So this significance of a motif is essentially saying, how many standard deviations are you away from not doing anything from zero on average? So it's a measure of the significance of the motif. And, um, and these are the things that we, we calculate. All right, so that's the description of uh, the Ismara model. Now I'm going to basically take an example data set and take you through all the results that the web server produces on this example data set. Yes. There's a question for you in the chat. How do I see that? I don't see the chat, I'm sorry. Can you maybe read it for me, Don? You're muted. Um, so Anima Sharma asks, one, wondering how will the depth of sequencing affect this, if it does? And uh, the mic is not working, that's why person types. Uh, you mean the, the, the depth of the, well, you, you, you didn't ask it. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm guessing that this is about the, the depth of the RNA seq and how this uh, how this affects. Um, so, so in contrast to to single cell RNA seq, where the depth of sequencing is basically controlling everything, uh, in bulk RNA seq, it's typically the case that that uh, the sequencing is deep enough for most typical RNA seq data sets that you get that actually for most genes the estimate of the gene expression is relatively accurate. So the size of the, the actual error bar on the gene expression itself is small relative to the error that the model is gonna make in any case, right? So again, the reality is so much more complicated than this simple linear model that we use that the linear model doesn't get very close to correctly predicting the expression levels in any case, okay? It's not gonna be very accurate in predicting expression levels. And so the error that the model makes is typically small compared to the measurement error on the gene expression. And so they don't make uh, a lot of, um, they don't have a big effect. It is true that for very low expressed genes where you have a, a low number of reads in each sample, the measurement noise does become actually um, an issue. And we have a version of Ismara, but I now I'm unsure Mikhail can comment on it if we actually use it, where we correct for this and we take into account that for very low expressed genes, there is also a significant measurement error. But the general answer is that um, in general, this does not play a big role. And the reason it doesn't is because the, the error in the model is anyway large relative to the measurement error. Okay, so I hope this answers the question. So the example data set that I'm gonna use is a data set um, about the um, liver development in mouse. So this is not our data, we just took it. It's a public data set. It's this Renault et al from 2014. They took 12 time points in triplicate. So they had 36 samples in, in total, starting two days before birth until 60 days after birth. And they sort of divided this in what they call pre-birth suckling stage and, and weaning stage of the, of the young mouse. And so they did the measurements. And so these pictures I've actually taken from the paper. So they made a clustering of gene expression. They found groups of genes that are co-expressed. And then they found that there are different kinds of metabolism categories that show these characteristic expression profiles. All right, so this is from the analysis of this data set. And so now we just took the raw data and gave it to Ismara. And so now I'm going to show you what Ismara finds on the same data. All right, so uh, maybe it's useful for you guys to actually go and look at the results on the Ismara web server, uh, you know, have a window by the side where you can look at it yourself. So if you go to the Ismara page, at the bottom of the page, there are these little tabs here, and one of the tabs is example results. And if you click on that, you will see that the, the top uh, 
example data set is this dynamics of mouse liver by Renault et al. And so if you click on that, you will, you will be taken to the ISMARA results. And those are the ones that I'm gonna now show you. Okay. So if you land on this page, the first thing that you will see is a table like this. Each row of this table corresponds to one of the regulatory motifs. So you see a name of the motif, you see its Z value. So this is its significance. So this guy is on average five standard deviations away from zero. What are the transcription factors linked to it? You get already a thumbnail that shows you how it changes its activity over the samples. And at the end, you see a sequence logo. So you see a picture of um, what, the, what kind of sites this motif binds to. And so this table is sorted by significance. The most, the most significant is at the top and less and less significant goes to the bottom. Now, what I'm actually going to show you is the results that you get when you average over the replicates. So Mikhail later is going to explain to you how ISMARA allows you to define groups of samples and, and calculate average activities over these groups. And so in particular, if you have replicates, you might want to do that. So this data set had replicates. So we, we did averaging over the replicates and I'm going to show you the, the results that you get after you average over these replicates. So this is the same table, but now averaged over the replicates. So this, to get to those results, you, you use the, the second link right in this list. So now you will, again, you get a table like this of motifs sorted by significance. And as you may notice, the order has now changed. Okay, so this motif that was one, two, three, four, H and F, four, A, this now has become the most significant motif after I replicated, uh, averaged over the replicates. So these thumbnails become simpler because now there are less samples, of course, because I've averaged over replicates. And also these uh, Z values have gone up. Okay, so by averaging over the replicates, the error bars have become smaller and things have become more significant. All right, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to look at the results for this top motif, HNF4A. And so first of all, here, I've just sort of got some stuff from the literature. I looked in the literature, you know, what is known about HNF4A regarding liver development. And of course, I'm showing you this example because this is something that has been well studied. So there is, you know, I can show you that that kind of these results match uh, what is known in the literature. Okay, so HNF4A is, is, a, is a key transcriptor factor in hepatocyte uh, liver cell development. So here's a paper, some review paper. HNF4A is essential for specification of hepatic progenitors from human pluripotent stem cells. And there is here some, some picture from this paper that says that HNF4A controls all these downstream transcription factors to make hepatic progenitors. So the fact that this guy comes out at the top is, uh, let's say, consistent with the, with the information in the literature. All right, so now if you click on this link, you can take it to a page with the, with the more specific results for this transcription factor. All right, so at the top of the page, you're gonna first get a list of all the transcription factor genes that are associated with this motif. In this case, there's only one, HNF4A. So you get links with the information about this gene. Second, you get a link to where on the genome is the promoter of HNF4A. So, and then below that, you get its activity profile. Okay, so these are all the samples from day minus two, two days before birth to 60 days after birth. And this is showing you the activity of this motif across time with its error bar, right? We also gave an error bar to the activity. So you see that it's, it's clearly going up across the time course. And it goes from about minus four to plus three. Okay, so that means that the average effect of a single binding site for HNF4A in the promoter goes from suppressing the expression by 40% on average to enhancing it by 30% on average relative to the mean across the entire time course. Okay, so that's what the meaning is of these, of these numbers. All right, then the second thing here is that uh, 
for this gene HNF4, there is a report of a Pearson correlation coefficient and a p-value, and then you can click on this. Now, what this shows you is the relationship between the predicted activity of this HNF4 motif and the expression of the HNF4 transcription factor itself, its mRNA expression, right? So it, it's important to realize that in contrast to many other methods, MARA does not use the expression of the transcription factor itself to predict the motif activities. The motif activities are entirely predicted by the response of predicted targets of this transcription factor. So we do, right? So if we see that all the genes that have predicted binding sites for HNF4 are going up, then we predict that HNF4 apparently became more active but we do not use the expression of HNF4 itself. So at this point, I can now compare the motif activities that we invert from the target behavior with what HNF4 alpha is doing itself. Okay, so if you click on this link, you'll get li a little scatter plot where on the x-axis is for each sample, each dot is a sample, what is the motif activity? And on the y-axis is what is the gene expression mRNA expression of the transcription factor itself. And so you see that even though it's quite noisy, there is a clear positive correlation between the expression level of the transcription factor at the mRNA level and its motif activity. All right. And this positive correlation indicates that HNF4A is acting as an activator in this thing, because when its expression goes up, its activity goes up. And in this case, it goes from about five to, to sort of seven. That means that the transcripts per million go from two to the five, which is 32, to two to seven, which is uh, 128. So there's a sort of a four, fourfold uh, upregulation of this transcript effect. Now, it is important to realize that by no means is it necessary that the that the expression level of the transcription factor correlates with the motif activity, okay? So if the transcription factor is not expressed at all, well, then it cannot do anything. But, there are, but it's very, very common in higher eukaryotes that the mRNA level of a transcription factor just stays the same, but its activity can change because it changes its nuclear localization from being in the cytoplasm to going to the nucleus, or it gets phosphorylated to go from an inactive to an active form, or it needs a cofactor to act, and then it goes from not having the cofactor available to having the cofactor available. So there are many, many other ways in which the activity of a transcription factor can change than at its mRNA level. And this, I would say, is one of the features of MARA that we infer the activity from the behavior of the targets and not from the mRNA level of the transcription factor. But if you see a correlation like this, it makes you more confident that this transcription factor is indeed responsible for these gene expression changes. Right, so to, to give you another example for how this looks for another motif, I went to the motif number, number three in the list. Its name is E2F2, E2F5. And in this case, there's one binding motif that is recognized by two different transcription factors, one called E2F2 and one called E2F5. And so this motif's activity is going down over time. Okay, so from about plus four to it's again from plus four, point four to minus point three, so a 70% change over the time course. And now I've looked at the correlation plots for the activity of this one motif with the two transcription factors that are known to bind to this motif. And you see that this E2F2 correlates very well with the motif activity, right? So it goes uh, from minus two to plus eight in gene expression, right? So that's, that's a 10, a change of 10. So because this is log base two, that's two to the 10. So that's a thousand fold upregulation at the mRNA level of this transcription factor and correlating perfectly with the motif activity. Whereas this E2F5 is much lower expressed. See, this goes between zero and one and a half. It doesn't also change very much and it doesn't correlate very much. So in this case, I feel really quite confident to say 
that it's the transcription factor e to f2 who is driving the change in motif activity and who is driving the change in the expression of the targets of this motif and not e to f5. So this is the way in which you can use this kind of sort of correlation between motif activity and expression to get an idea of who's the guy that's actually responsible for doing this. Now, here's another example from further down the list. This is CEBPE. -E. The targets of this motif also go up over time. So its motif activity goes up with time. But when you look at the correlation plot, you see that there is a negative correlation, right? As the motif activity goes up, the expression level goes down of this transcription factor by a factor of about 30 fold or something like this. And so that indicates that this transcription factor is acting as a repressor in the system because as its gene expression goes up, the motif activity goes down, the expression of its targets go down. Okay, so this comparison with the gene expression also allows you to basically uh, hypothesize whether this transcription factor is acting as a, an activator or as a repressor. All right. So the next thing is that we're going to give you a list of predicted targets of the motif. So importantly, right, we, so we have these candidate targets that we've gotten by predicting these binding sites, but we want to make a more accurate prediction by actually looking at, well, for which promoters does it seem that this binding site is actually important for predicting the expression of the promoter? So what we do conceptually is the following. For each motif, M, we find all the promoters where there is at least one predicted binding site for M, right? So where the site count is bigger than zero. And then we in silico mutate this promoter to remove all the binding sites for M. So basically what it means is we just set this one entry in the site count matrix to zero, right? So in this entire matrix, we now make one entry zero we remove the binding sites for M in promoter P. And then we fit again the entire model, fitting all the motif activities, now using this mutated matrix M0. And we calculate a basically how well this model fits the data. So this is some, you know, it's a complicated integral actually, but, but it doesn't matter for right now. So we get one number that just says, how well can we fit the data, all data, with the original matrix N and divided by how well can we fit the data with this mutated matrix N tilde where this one entry has been made zero. We take the log ratio. And so this ratio is basically telling you how, how much better can you fit with the binding site than without the binding site. And this is a, now a measure of the uh, importance of motif M for promoter P. Okay, so this sort of cartoon says, let's say these dots here are the express, uh, expression profile that we observe for promoter P. The green is our uh, original model, our predictions. And now when we remove the binding sites for motif M, we get these red predictions. And then basically we quantify how much worse are the red predictions than the green prediction. And this is now the predicted target score for this motif and this promoter. So for the more technical among you, so it turns out that this target, this log likelihood ratio, actually to a very good approximation can be calculated as follows. So for each promoter and each sample, you can calculate a chi-square, which is the square deviation between the observed and the predicted gene expression using the fitted motifs. So it's the square deviation. And now you can recalculate the square deviation using the mutated matrix N0. So basically just removing the effects of this one motif to this one promoter. I call that the chi-square of promoter P in sample S with motif M removed. And then if you take the difference between these two and sum it over all samples, and divided by the average chi-squared of all promoters across all samples, it turns out that that ratio is very close to this, to this log ratio. So that's actually how we calculate the, these target scores. All right, so if you go scroll a little bit down, you will see that for uh, HNF4, 
A, there you're going to get a list with predicted targets. So like all lists, these lists are searchable. So you can search for genes in the list. You can change the number of entries. You can reorder the, the, the order of these entries in the table. But in general, they're ordered by, uh, by this target log likelihood score. And so here, this top target is the gene CYP2C29. It's from the cytochrome P450 family. And its log likelihood score that it is a target is uh, 95.8. And so you get here a link to the actual promoter of this target gene. And if you click on this, you will be taken to a web browser. And this web browser shows the start of this gene. So this is the start of this CYP2C29 with its promoter, that is this little uh, sand colored. Uh, box here and all the predicted binding sites in this promoter and so by looking where is the HNF4A site you can now see this is the actual site on the genome where we predict that HNF4A is acting through and so if you let's say wanted to do an experiment mutating this binding site and seeing how this affects the expression you would know where to go because there's a prediction of where this binding site is. All right, so this is this, uh, this target list. And um, then there are various ways in which we try to sort of give some insight of what kind of sets of genes and pathways are targeted by HNF4A in this data set, okay? So one way we do this is we, we look for um, gene ontology categories who are enriched among the targets. So basically what we do for each gene ontology category, starting from the most specific ones, we calculate the sum of these log likelihood scores and the average of the target log likelihood scores for the genes in the category. And then we sort all the, the categories by these average scores. So you get a table. So this is for, uh, for this uh, HNF4A in this data set which you can order either by total log likelihood, which is the sum of the log likelihoods of all the targets in this category, or the average log likelihood per target, right? So this for this category, so this is epoxy genetics P450 pathway. So the P450 pathway has a total log likelihood of 391, 11.9 per gene. So you can also search and sort this, this list in various ways. <laughs> Another way in which we try to give you an idea of what are the genes that are targeted by this transcription factor in this system is using the string database. Maybe some of you heard about it. So this is a, a tool that is made by the lab of uh, Christian von Meering in, in Zurich, where basically uh, they, they've mined the literature and data to find functional connections between genes. So either they may interact directly they may co-occur in abstracts of papers. They might be co-expressed and so on and so on. And they basically make networks of known links between genes. And so what we do is we take all the predicted targets of this motif in this data set. So we take the targets from HNF4A. We submit those to String. And String makes for us a picture of the network of just these target genes for HNF4 in this system. And then we download this picture and we show it on the website. So this is the picture for the targets of HNF4A. And you basically see that there are certain groups of genes that are highly connected so that they're known to have a lot to do with each other. And if you then look and you can click on these things, if you if there is a link to the string website and then you can click on each of these genes and see what is known about these genes, you will see that this group of genes, for example, is, is involved in what's called the urea cycle. This is this cytoph cytochrome P450 group. This group of genes is, is involved in heme transport coagulation. This group of genes is involved in a process called the complement cascade. And so by basically exploring this network picture, you can also uh, create, uh, gain some intuition about what are the pathways and functional processes. Yes, Martin. Uh, 
Yeah, I was just wondering, why are there unconnected nodes like CDC 151? Well, because apparently, according to the string database, there are no connections with any of the other gene in this set, right? Because this is, remember, these are only the target genes of HNF4A in this data set, right? So it's only the genes whose gene expression seems to really depend on the motif activity of HNF4A and have a binding site for HNF4A in the promoter. And so among that set of genes, this guy, MUP12, has no known connections to anybody else. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering why, why does string actually put them onto the, the graph at all? Well, because they were among the targets that we submitted to. Ah, okay, okay. All right. So now I got it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, the next thing down is we want to give a, a picture of interactions between HF, HNF4A and other regulators. Okay, so what we've done is we've, we've taken HNF4A as a node sort of in the regulatory network and then looked around it and say, are there any promoters of other regulators that we predict HNF4 targets, or is there any other regulator that targets the promoter of HNF4 alpha? And we show you this, uh, this sort of this sort of local picture of the network around HNF4 alpha. There is a slider on the right, and the slider allows you to basically increase or decrease the cutoff on the target score of the interaction. And so here I set it at a threshold of 4.7. So there's a log likelihood ratio of uh, 4.7. And then it will show you all the, all the links that exist between HNF4A and other regulators, direct links at that cutoff. So one of the first one is this one here. It has a score of 17.3. It points from HNF4 alpha to NR1I3. This means that with this, Target score, HNF4 alpha regulates the expression of NR1I3. This gene is also known as CAR, the constitutive understone receptor. So this I just got from a wiki page on this gene. Uh, it's a nuclear receptor. It's a sensor of endobiotic, xenobiotic substances. And it's known to be also involved in the uh, development of liver cells. So it makes sense that this HNF4 alpha would target this. Here's another example. NR5A2 is targeted. This is also a known transcription factor in liver development. And here a third example. So here, so this is this link. You see there's a link both from HNF4IA to HNF1A and from HNF1A back to HNF4A. If you mouse over, you will see these scores are 3.6 and, and 4.6. And so basically it's, it's saying that they regulate each other both ways, HNF4A and HNF1A. And in fact, I looked it up, this is known. Okay, so in the literature, it's known that HNF4 alpha and HNF1 alpha, they, they regulate each other's all right. Um, so, uh, so I have here another example of another motif. This is uh, this H E two F two and E two F one. Um, both of these are downregulated over time. The transcription factor expression correlates very well with this downregulation. And, and so the fact that these things are going down in, in, with almost exactly the same activity profile and the exact same expression suggests this is made one pathway. If you look at the string network of the targets of this thing, you get this incredibly connected set of genes, all right? So this is about as connected as it will ever look. And that tells you that this has been studied to death, all right? So most of the time, the amount of links is not really so reflective of how many interactions there really are. It's just how intensely has it been studied in my experience. 
And so this is apparently a pro process that has been intensely studied. And if you look at it, then you will see that these are all genes involved in the cell cycle, and in particular, in the initiation of replication. So if you look at this in, in more detail, also with these gold categories, you will see that these transcription factors are, or these targets are regulating, regulating initiation of DRA, DNA replication, that is the transition from G1 to S of the cell cycle. The fact that their, their activity goes down with time basically tells you that the amount of proliferation of the cells through this developmental time course is systematically decreasing with time. All right, so the final thing uh, I want to tell you about is that so, so far, all the results are from the point of view of the regulators. So you get the most important regulators sorted, and then for each regulator, you can see what genes do they target, how do they change their activity, where are the binding sites, and so on. But in many cases, people also have, let's say, favorite genes that they know that are important in the system, and they rather not like to know for this gene of interest, how is it regulated? What are your predictions for how my gene is regulated? So we provide this too. So we provide a list of all promoters sorted by what, how well their expression is explained by the MARA model, which is called this fourth fraction of variance explained by the model. Or you can also search for your gene of interest. Now, if you click on this link, you will get this table. I should tell you that sometimes it takes a minute to load this table. It's a very large table because it had all promoters in it. It has to be made on the fly. And so it sometimes it takes a minute to create it. But once um, it's been created, you get this list like this. And it's sorted uh, by, uh, by default by how well we can explain the expression of this gene across the samples using the model. model. So you get the promoter. What is the mean expression of this promoter? So this is a log 2 TPM of 4.8. Uh, it's standard deviation across the samples and what fraction of its variance is explained. Okay, so, but you can sort this list in various ways. You can search it, search it, right? So you can also look at what, who's the highest expressed gene on average or what gene is most variable. You can sort it in different ways. Now, if you click on this link, you will get to a page like this. And so in blue here, you see the expression of this gene of this transcript, uh, sorry, of this promoter over time. And in orange, the predicted expression, and in this case, by default, you first get the predicted expression when we have turned off the effects of all motifs. So basically, this expression profile, which is almost flat, is just given by the sort of slight changes in normalization across the samples. And uh, so without any predictions by the model, it would be like this. If I now click on this green bottom, uh, button, I can turn on the predicted effects of all the motifs. So if I do that, turn them on, you see that this is the ex predicted expression profile that, that Mara gives. If I take into account the effects of all the motifs, right? So there's actually, there's quite a long list of motifs here and they're now all turned on. And you see that now this expression is actually quite well predicted across the samples. This is an outlier, right? Remember, this was at the top of the list. So in general, the expression is nowhere near as well uh, predicted for most genes. But for this gene, it just happens to come out well, well predicted. And now you can go one motif at a time and turn on the effects of individual motifs and see how that changes the predicted expression profile. And so for each motif, so this list is all the regulators that are predicted to regulate this promoter sorted by their log likelihood score. So this is the chi-square score for each uh, of the motifs. So it's 16 for this top one, six for the next, six point eight for the next one. This is how many binding sites does this motif have in this promoter, so this E to F2, E to F5 motif has two binding sites, and this is the Z value of, uh, of the E to F2 motif. And so you can now play around and you can turn uh, the effects of the predictions of individual motifs on or off. So the purpose of this is to show you 
what are the sort of top regulators that are predicting to target this motif and sort of sort of explore how much the, the predicted gene expression changes if you turn those regulators on and off. All right, so uh, finally, um, there is a whole set of flat files and reports, also all the HTML files that you see here that you can download so that you can basically explore your data offline, that you don't have to do it through the website, and with which you can also do all kinds, whatever kind of downstream analysis you want to construct yourself on these results using these files. And uh, what is in these files will be discussed this afternoon. So with that, I've come to the end of this part about this Mara. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge some of the people that were involved in this. Uh, so Piotr Balwitz was the main developer of the uh, Ismara, together with the help of Mikhail, that is also now supporting it and, uh, and responsible for the web interface. These binding site predictions were made by a tool developed by uh, Phil Arnold. And uh, recently, so we made a ZebraFish version that uh, Georgia worked on. And we also, but I won't talk about this today. So one of the new things we have is that we have a single cell version of this, of this tool for single cell RNA seq but as I said, I have not, this will be another tutorial uh, some point in, in the future. All right, so Ma, I see uh, Marek, you have a question. Hi, uh, so I have a question related to the model. So this all was like that we really know a lot of about the transcription factor in the organism. Mm -hmm. So what happens if we if I have an organism we for which we don't know about all the transcription factors or we don't know the binding site for the transcription factor? Uh, how sensitive this model is to this to some unexplained transcription variation? Or if the transcription variation measured by the RNA seq is assigned only to subset of Binding site for some yes motives or something like that. So how how complete my information must be so this would work? Um, okay, so when we when we first did this in two thousand nine, I think I had about two hundred motifs. In, in yeah. human race. so about uh, a third of what we have now, and um, and this was plenty enough to get lots of data. So, in general, it's the case. So, if you say, "Look, I have this uh, this weird uh, single cell eukaryote, whatever paramecium, and we don't even know the binding sites for one transcription factor in my organism." Well, then, then there's really not much. But, uh, and so the more you have, the better. But um, I would say if you have at least a number, several dozens for which predictions can be made, then uh, it's certainly worthwhile uh, to do this. But of course, it's clear that you will miss a lot of details uh, related to transcription factors that we simply don't know about. And 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 it's sort of, yeah. That that's a, you know, if if we don't know about them, then then it's very hard to predict what they're doing, right? So it, that's a sort of an inherent limitation of the approach. Okay. So there is another question in the, in the chat. Um, how do you control for cyclic nature of TS regulation, like the example shown where two of the TS were affecting each other. Ah, yeah, what is the best way to answer that? So we're not trying to fit any sort of a dynamic model, right? So there's no way in which we're trying to write, let's say differential equations and say, you know, as this transcription factor becomes more active and then targets the promoter of that transcription factor, then that one becomes more active a little bit later and this goes feeds back and does this and that. We're not doing any model of any type like that. 
all we're doing is we're going one sample at a time. We're looking at the genome-wide expression profile of all the genes across the sample. We have the predicted binding sites and the promoters of all these genes. And then we're trying to predict what is the best set of assumed activities of motifs that can predict the expression levels that we see in this sample. So basically each sample is looked at independently and a fit is made for the motif activities in each sample. And then after we've done all that, now we ask for a given gene, is the expression of this gene well predicted by changes in the motif activity of one of these regulators that has a binding site in the promoter? And if it is, then we say, apparently the activity of this motif is important for the expression of this target. And so it, it's totally possible that we predict, well, that the activity of A is important for the expression of B, and the activity of B is important for the expression of, of A. This is totally possible. And we're not trying to sort of now work out, well, how is that going to set up some sort of feedback loop and so on, right? We're just looking one sample at a time. Is, is the regulator apparently important for the expression of the, of the predicted target? So we, we, cert, we sort of never go into that kind of level of model. Okay. I see Martin has another question. Yes, thank you. I was just wondering, um, uh, regarding the string DB image you showed earlier, yeah. where you said it's highly connected. I think this is just a bit of sugar, isn't it? Um, basically, uh, you, your modeling doesn't rely on the string DB. Uh, this no. Is, uh, no. No. And, no. And, and then I was just wondering, actually, uh, your opinion, I guess. <laughs> uh, String DB uh, gives you information on, on, on protein and protein interactions and predicted protein protein interactions. And I think a lot of the, the density of this graph came along because the predicted protein protein interactions were included. Yes. Do you think do you think they are useful? <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna be drawn out on this. So so no, I mean the only it's really important to realize that. The only purpose of these string pictures is to, to help you explore what might be the pathways that are targeted by this factor in this, in this system, right? So just trying to help you uh, uh, create hypotheses for what is this transceptor factor doing, what is the meaning that it's predicted to, 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 to regulate these targets. And I must say, in many cases, the string picture can be very helpful in, in you see connected groups of genes, you look at what these genes do, and it gives you a reasonable hypothesis for, aha, maybe this transcription factor is targeting something having to do with that. And it's not very reliable on every link being very, very uh, accurate or, or reliable. And so I, I personally have no... Uh, uh, no idea of how reliable in, individual edges are. I would say don't ever rely on an individual edge. In the same way, I would say don't rely on an individual target prediction of our model either, right? So I am really quite confident about the general motif activities. If Mara says this motif is important, then I believe in general it actually is. Do we always get the transcription factor that's binding to it correct? No. Sometimes there is another transcription factor that can bind to the same sites, and we might get it wrong. That, so that's already a little bit less reliable, but generally still quite reliable. But now when you go down to the level of individual target genes and say, this gene, this individual gene was pushed by this individual transcription factors, then I would say that's already... You know, you would take, have to take that with already a bit more grains of salt, that you cannot always rely on that to be accurate. But maybe a group of target genes that are all in one pathway, if you get many of them, well, then it's again quite reliable that probably that pathway is targeted, right? So depending on the level of granularity, you should sort of assign more or less confidence. I think we have to, unless there's something very um, pressing, I think we should stop now for a half hour 
uh, break, have some coffee. And there are two questions left in the in the chat, but we can also do it after the break, I guess. I, are they uh, going to be short or? Well, one is: Are you planning to add Drosophila genome in Ismara? Yes, but I won't make any promises about the time frame. Sorry. And then, uh, if I have a synthetic DNA sequence, can I upload sequence and check it with Ismara? I don't understand. Again? Sorry. If I have a synthetic DNA sequence, can I upload that sequence and check it with Ismara? Okay, that, that person has to talk to us offline because they don't understand that question. Yeah. By the way, the Drosophila, so maybe I can turn this question around. So if anybody has a nicely curated collection of regulatory motifs for Drosophila transcription factors that uh, they sh and they're interested of getting Ismara for Drosophila, they should contact us. Because really the main hurdle of this thing is to is to curate a good collection of, of, of non-redundant regulatory motifs. And once that's done, implementing the other steps of Mara is easy for us. But that step is a, a step that requires quite some investment, and, and that's sort of what, what's limiting us. So if somebody says, oh no, but we, we have blah blah blah, then that could be helpful. Yeah, so then there was a, a there's only a comment left that um, that there you can filter string DB connections by confidence, source of information, co-expression experiments, yeah. data mining, and uh, if Ismara supports that filtering on your platform. Okay, so on our on our website you just get the picture from string, so that that's non interactive. But if you click on the picture, you get taken to string. You get the same picture, and now you have all the features available to you of string. 